The Jesuits are a group of priests and brothers founded by St. Ignatius of Loyola about 400 years ago in order to help in the renewal of the Catholic Church, which was badly in need of reform at the time. Also at that time, it was a period of great exploration. At the new design of ship, people could sail for weeks and months on end without having to touch land. And so, for the first time ever, the, uh, the whole globe was explored. And St. Ignatius was inspired to begin to send his men out to all over those lands that Europe had only uncovered for the first time. Way out to the east, to India, and then eventually some went out to the west, to the Americas. We come on to modern times then, and in the 19th century, when the Pope uh, was still trying to recover, and so was the Catholic Church, from the French Revolution. Uh, it had uh, devastated the Church in France, and France was the, the most powerful and wealthy Catholic country in Europe. So it was a great blow. Uh, to have the church devastated in so short a time. So the Jesuits were given the responsibility to look after what they called the Zambezi mission. It was the whole of Zimbabwe, uh, a good part of Zambia and some of Mozambique. And so in 1879, about a dozen men set out from South Africa in Grahamstown uh, in four ox carts. Uh, the ox cart could cover about 20 kilometers a day, so it took them four months of travel to get to Bulawayo. In basically in 1879, a international group of Jesuits came forth to establish the Zambezi mission uh, which extended from the Cape right through until basically some line which is in the DRC uh, today. And it's a huge area and they came up from Grahamstown uh, where there was already a Jesuit school called St. Aidan's and on their way up they stopped off in Botswana to set up their first mission that uh, was um, at Tati and then they came north to Lobengula's capital here in Matabili land and with the idea of uh, setting up a mission close to the capital and that's actually where we're standing. We're standing in the uh, ruins of the original Jesuit mission at Old Bulawayo. So it was established in 1879 and it continued not necessarily always successfully until around 1888 when it was abandoned in favor of uh, another piece of land that was granted to the Jesuits uh, by King Lobengula at uh, Old Mpendeni. So this really is the first modern uh, um, Catholic uh, center mission uh, in uh, the state of modern day Zimbabwe. Uh, and it's just uh, very close to Bulawayo. And basically I'm standing in the core building uh, of the mission. 
Now, when the Jesuits arrived, um, they weren't necessarily greeted with great enthusiasm and the king put them off for some while, but he finally relented uh, you, basically because of the work of the brothers. The brothers were um, the, the, the real key to, to, to getting access to the Indebele state because the brothers were able to repair guns, repair wagons, and were really great workhorses um, who provided the church uh, such an important foundation, not only of this mission, but many of the missions that come later. And uh, so they were allowed to purchase an existing store that had been built by a, a, a German Jewish trader by the name of Hrit, uh, who decided he wanted to leave the, uh, the interior and go back to uh, South Africa. And so they purchased the original house, and this is basically what I'm standing in. And just outside there was a huge iron shed, the store, and um, that the Jesuits converted into their first sort of um, mission. And then this, this building, they actually raised the roof uh, and they thatched it. And um, where I'm standing is in one of the rooms of one of the brothers. This original room was subdivided with a brick wall. And um, it's here that, uh, uh, some of the early uh, founders of the uh, Zambezi mission actually lived. Um, uh, the, if we look outside through this uh, window, you can see a couple of large trees. They actually mark the front boundary to the mission. Those trees were actually poles cut and put down as a wooden palisade by Father Krunenbachs. Uh, so we know the actual date that those poles went in and they've taken root. Not all of the poles take root, a certain species, uh, uh, so we know the age of that. And actually where I'm looking, right next to that tree, you can see a little bit of a stone pillar. There's a broken one uh, on the right, and that was the original entrance to the area. So they were here for uh, a decade. They gradually build up, they, they build additional walls, they build a separate kitchen, um, they build a, a, a completely separate building as, their, as a chapel. They weren't just reusing existing buildings. And they, they, they were very important as in terms of influencing the Indebele, but there were never any Indebele converts. Uh, at that time, the, the king uh, was all powerful and he he forbade any sort of uh, um, acculturation or adoption of what was perceived as a, a non indebeli religious or even social system. I think that was probably more that they were worried about is this disrupting the, the social system. And so um, the, the king, by the way, is, he is about a kilometer away in that direction. That's where the, the royal uh, capital was uh, from uh, until 1880. So um, the Jesuits are here only a short time when the king was here, and then he moves away to another capital uh, and uh, the Jesuits stay here. So in a sense, they, they were on the edge of, of, the, of the actual uh, king's development. Um, they did have a couple of converts, but they were largely um, traders who came in uh, into this area. Uh, there were two, uh, what we would probably in modern Southern African terms uh, call um, colored people, colored hunters that came into the area. One of which was actually had uh, developed leprosy and he was abandoned by his fellow hunters. And the, the Jesuits actually took him in and built him a little uh, a building over there where he stayed with them uh, for a couple of years before um, passing away. And he's actually buried uh, close by and next to the grave of one of the Jesuits. Um, so in a sense, it wasn't a, a great evangelical mission. Uh, it was establishing a presence uh, and it's, it is the roots, it's the basic roots of the church, which then uh, take another decade or two to change the approach and policy. Um, here they were very much I suppose the king may have almost seen them as almost like equivalent to traders, although they, they weren't trading and uh, this did disturb the king at times, as why are you here if you're not trading? 
Um, so it's an important site in terms of Zimbabwean um, Catholic uh, history. So they split the little group, split up into three, and uh, one group headed off for the Zambezi and uh, crossed the Zambezi River opposite Chief Wemba's and were accepted there. However, Father Turord, who led the group, after walking down the Zambezi, 150 kilometres down the Zambezi Valley in the month of August, he survived just three weeks before he died of malaria. And that was basically the end of that mission. There was one, there was one point where they got half across and Turord was on one bank and the Pelshton on the other bank, and the, the guys crossing suddenly put up the price. And De Pelshton, the story goes, De Pelshton had a long beard and a sort of long hair, and he, he, he stared at this guy, and he, they said he looked like a lion. Even Loban Gula said he looked like a lion. He was a, he was a kind of fierce character. And he stared at this fellow and said, you will get me across. I don't know why I kind of... But at any rate, the, the fellow was, um, was uh, subdued, as it were, and, and decided he better do what he was... <laughs> anyway, they got across, and then they went on to Mwembas. They got a good welcome, and they founded a mission. You know, it was very easy to found a mission there uh, at Mwembas. And uh, de Pelshton was in great spirits. He thought, this is great. This is, now we've got a, the whole of Zambia's open to us. There were moments of great optimism amongst the Jesuits where they thought, now we've had success. Unfortunately, the moments of disappointment far outweighed the moments of uh, optimism. Um, but anyway, he decided to leave Terod there and brother Verven, I think it was, with him. And he went back with the other brother who was with him. And, and then Terod got malaria. And um, he got worse and worse. They sent a message back somehow to De Pelch and say, look, we're in desperate state that we're, we're sick and, and Terod is, is dying and so on. And the king is taking all our property and all this kind of thing. So de Pelchen, God, who was himself not feeling well at this time, he had to sort of organize a rescue mission. And that's where Nig came along. And by the time Nig gets there, uh, Terod is dead. And um, Verven had to bury him. But Verven was in a terrible state by this time. And so Nig literally had to carry him away. The second mission was to the east, to Mount Selinda, among the Unguni. Uh, again, the distance was too far, and two of the fathers died within a matter of weeks. Father Law only survived a few weeks again, and that mission collapsed. Two things happened. Um, <clears throat> one was completely egregious in the sense that um, uh, Father Well had this habit of walking ahead of the, of the wagon, saying his breviary or something, and he'd go so far ahead that they actually lost sight of him. And on one day, he lost sight of them. He didn't know where they were. He couldn't find his way back. It's the most stupid thing. You think of all the things that can go wrong. But he literally lost his way. And they spent two days looking for him, three days looking for him, firing shots in the air. and They hunted every, they couldn't find him. And he couldn't find them. So in the end, they thought he was dead. And they thought there was going to be an attack on them and that the wagon were. So they decided to abandon the wagon. The three of them went on alone, carrying what they could on their backs. Well, of course, eventually they did get to Mzilas, but they were exhausted and they ran out of quinine and they were hit by malaria. Uh, and both Law and Headley went down seriously with malaria. To Sadler, because Mzila was, gave them a 
good welcome, but he didn't know why they came, what they wanted. He couldn't understand. I mean, they weren't traders, they weren't miners, they weren't travelers. Who were they, sort of thing? He didn't follow. So he, um, at any rate, he, he said, well, you can't just come empty-handed. Go back and get the wagon. Well, the only one who could go back and get the wagon was de Sadler. He was the only healthy guy amongst them. Law was looking forward to the wagon coming, but it, it took ages. So. Law eventually died. I mean, it was a sort of long story, but I mean, he got weaker and weaker, and he couldn't, the food they gave him, the local food, he just couldn't digest it. And so, and, and poor old Headley was watching this going on, and he himself was getting weak. And, and so on, there's stories about uh, Law saying his last mass sort of propped up with strings to the ceiling, just trying to get him to sit up so that he could say in Mass for the last time. But anyway, he got weaker and weaker and eventually died at the end of November. Anyway, Headley decided that nothing he could do, he could just die, wait until he died, or he could try to get back. The interesting thing is that he lived for another 53 years. <laughs> anyway, he, he uh, tried to make his way back but he, in the end, he had to be carried on stretcher all the way back, or pretty well all the way back. And he got back. By this time, messages were getting through that well had been found. He'd, he'd been found by a local man, and this local man had taken him to his house, or to his hut, and looked after him, a uh, good Samaritan. And he was there for two or three weeks. And then well sent a message to to, to, to the others, which was um, intercepted by de Sadler. So de Sadler now knew that Well was alive. And so then Headley was coming up, not knowing anything, and he got the message that Well was alive and, that, and so on. And then they had a meeting, all three of them, at the wagon, eventually. <laughs> so that was a happy day, no doubt, with a three of three. <laughs> ah! And, and uh, de Sadler said that Headley was in an atrocious state. He, was, he hadn't changed his clothes for five months, and he, he, his body was covered in sores and, and wounds and, and uh, what do you call them, these ulcerations and stuff, and he was in a dreadful state. So Sadler, Sadler just had to wash him and clean him and medicate, give him whatever medication they could get. The, the interesting thing is the wagon was untouched. <clears throat> and then they said, now what do we do? So they decided to go to Sofala on the coast and get supplies. So they did that, but not Headley. Headley wasn't well enough. So he stayed with the wagon and the other two went off to Sofala on foot, of course. Got to Sofala by this time, Weld really had bad malaria and he died in Sofala. And so now you have de Sadler in Sofala and Headley by the wagon. And so <clears throat> obviously de Sadler gets as much supplies as he possibly can carry and goes back to Headley and they, they sort of spend a day or two there and then they decide, we're, you know, we can't do anything. We've got to go back to Bulawayo. We're, we're not priests, we can't do anything, <laughs> so we go back to Bulawayo. But they'd spent 18 months and nothing, complete failure. I mean, total failure. The third effort was to among the Lozi in the western province and it was the uh, superior father, de Pelcha, who headed off right to up to the uh, the crawl of Chief Luanika, who was very happy to see them and gave them permission to stay. Uh, but they said that they would have to go back and get supplies and then they would come again. When they came again two years later, a Protestant missionary had got in before them and the permission was refused. And it was on this trip that uh, Brother de Wilder uh, drowned in the river on the way up. They never recovered his body. And today the local Catholic parish at Lusu Falls set up a little monument in memory of him. So that was uh, the first Zambezi mission 
which wasn't successful. They retired to South Africa to regroup and to spend some time together. They felt that they were a very mixed group of different nationalities and they needed time to be with each other, to bond, so that when they came again, they would be sure and would know each other and have a more definite plan. Law, interestingly, interestingly, law <clears throat> uh, pleaded with the Pelsian to spend time in Grahamstown doing what today we would call bonding. In other words, spending time together. Look, we're going to be in a bloody wagon for God knows how long, how many months, very living very close together, getting on each other's nerves day in, day out. We better get to know each other, first of all, so that we can cope with the psychological strains of living together. I mean, when you go to the novice ship, the first thing you do, you sit down and you tell people who you are, where you come from, about your family and your background and so on. People get to know each other. They never did that. They just sort of um, seemed to presume that just because they were Jesuits, they, they would somehow get on well together. Most of us don't really go into the details of the lives of those early people. I mean, how many of us know that, for example, um, when, they, when Law and his companions set out, they had to cross, before they even got to the Sabi, they had to cross something like 37 rivers. You'd have to, you know, you have to cross all these rivers and so on. <coughs> and then, very often, there's no road. I mean, there's nowhere to go. So they had to cut down trees. You just imagine cutting your way through. This is high, high veld where we are now, and the trees are sort of weaker, if you like. But in, those, in some of those low veld places, uh, the trees would be quite strong and, and tough and, and so on to make your way through them. No, no, no joke. So no wonder they went very slowly. Sometimes they probably only went one kilometer a day. I think crossing the Sabi was a big, was a big, because that would be flowing, and they had to find a crossing place. Uh, that was a, that was a, you know, all these things took a long time, and 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 a lot of, as you say, the resilience was really, and it wore them out. I mean, it, they really got worn out. And as I say, they didn't take enough quinine with them. You know why? You know why they didn't put any structure here. After the agreement with the king, they marked this place as a message. But unfortunately, that time. At the situation there was very, very fluid that they couldn't put any structure. Because there was a barrack of the, the impact barrack, which is in the western side I mean, of this place. When the things were not moving on or right, their superior called them back to, 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 to Grahamstown. When they came back, they found that the, the company had back onto their place, their farm, they were taking part of their farm on the southern side the of, of this place. And then they thought why is I mean, to, to, to move it northwards. So that is, they compensated that land that was taken by the company there. Here they didn't, they didn't put any structure. They planted this day, a book in flowers. And there was a, there was a, there were, there were poles that were dug here at the enclosure here. Or sometimes earlier, the poles were still here. Because I remember seeing some of the poles here, which was left by them.